from DLA Piper, this is the Beyond the Curve podcast. This is Christy Kung. I'm a healthcare regulatory partner in DLA's Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia offices. And I'm joined today by my partners, Ray Williams and Danny Toby. Ray is a partner in our Philadelphia office and focuses on the product liability issues and digital health and medical devices. And Danny is a partner in our Dales office and focuses on litigation and risk related advice to companies, particularly in the artificial intelligence in medicine space. Ray, Danny, welcome. Is there any additional information you'd like to add about yourselves before we jump into the podcast? Thanks, Christy. Hi, Christy. It's Ray. I appreciate just talking to you guys. I think this will be really fun. Yeah, that was a good intro. I'm good. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So today we're talking about digital health and a time of COVID-19 and obviously a lot going on and hopefully in this conversation we'll get into how digital health is being used both in terms of combating the pandemic as well as how we might drive insights and experiences from the pandemic that we can use to accelerate technological innovation and hopefully increase the adoption of digital health. So what I can start off with is from a telemedicine aspect, what's been going on, and then we'll get into mobile apps and artificial intelligence. From a telemedicine aspect, everybody knows there's just been a seismic shift in how we are delivering healthcare services in the U.S., and that while there were regulatory obstacles to the provision of remote healthcare prior to the pandemic, About a decade's worth of change virtually happened overnight, and those regulatory obstacles were addressed and relieved on both the state and federal level. We're currently operating in a relatively lenient environment where telemedicine can reach the most people and do the most good. I think in terms of what we've seen it do, telemedicine has helped screen individuals who may be at a risk for exposure and direct them to the appropriate environments for their care delivery, whether that is within their home or to a mobile testing site or to the hospital, which has helped reduce potential viral exposure, both of individuals as well as the frontline healthcare workers. Hospitals who have adopted telemedicine within the hospital have been able to use telemedicine carts to deliver services to COVID-19 positive individuals and reduce the amount of time that healthcare workers are spending in the room with patients, preserving personal protective equipment. And then also with respect to the continuation of care for both chronic and acute conditions for individuals in their home that due to shelter in place orders or general concern of entering a healthcare facility are able to get the care that they need in the comfort of their own home from their healthcare provider. Yeah. So there's quite a bit going on. Yeah. And I would certainly say from a personal perspective, being an African-American black person, that the ability to actually do this telehealth and to talk to your doctor over the phone, all the precautions that are being taken are really important in the community. And it's really appreciated what's going on. It's amazing how well it's working. Ray, say more about that. That's really interesting. I had thought about it in terms of a shift from rural use where telemedicine was focused. What are you seeing? So I would certainly say that within the African-American Black community, there's caution in terms of going into hospitals. There's caution in being in high populated venues. And that would, of course, be going to see your doctor. And so there's obviously a catch-22 situation. We know that in the African-American Black population, there's a higher incidence rate of diabetes and high blood pressure, and there's a lack of health care for patients. But the catch-22 aspect of this, of course, is that Given those issues, you need to go into the hospitals, you need to go see doctors, and we're pushing within the community for more people to get health care and to get treatment for their diabetes and for their high blood pressure and these other issues. But of course, COVID-19 is potentially waiting for you. So telehealth has been an opportunity for the patients in the communities to actually call their doctors 
and not have to go into the hospital to see their doctors online and not have to go into the hospital and, of course, to have people come to their houses to work with them. Yeah, as a parent, I'm seeing just the incredible efficiency gains that telemedicine can bring. I mean, we have three kids who are constantly throwing themselves off of tall objects and shutting their hands (laughs) and doors. And normally with parents that work and you have to be running the other kids around too, that's a whole day of your life lost when one of them decides to jump off the jungle gym. But I've just been blown away by how quickly we can resolve things now with telemedicine. And you know, it's funny, I'm a digital health lawyer, but I'm also a late adopter on almost everything. But <laughs> Christy, to your point, it's like, never waste a good crisis. This has pushed me towards using more telemedicine services. And it's been pretty good so far. What are you guys seeing in terms of quality of care and access? Yeah, I have to agree with you. I've been doing telemedicine work for about a decade, and I have never had a telehealth encounter until the pandemic. <laughs> I think, to your point, I'm just a late adopter at the same time. But I yeah. agree. It was phenomenal getting a telehealth service. It was right on time. I didn't feel like I missed anything not being there in person. I'm one of those people that probably won't go back, even when this situation is behind us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... Let me say this, that telehealth has been wonderful and it's certainly given opportunities for people to seek care without leaving their home. One of the other things that I look at in this digital health space is the medical devices that have been designed, created to do basically the same thing. And if you guys think about it in terms of the sensors that people are wearing to determine their insulin level, how cool is that? compared to having to inject themselves previously. And then having that information go into the phone and then into a server and then going on some cloud somewhere. Danny, Christy, you understand this better than I do, but then eventually getting to their doctor to take a look at it. And I think that that advancement is really cool. I'm a product liability lawyer. And so everything that touches (laughs) this product or this device increases the risk for liability. So I do think that from a manufacturing standpoint, that if you are manufacturing these types of products, you do increase your risk for liability. But to me, the benefit far outweighs that risk. What are you guys saying? Yeah, I totally agree, Ray. This is what I spend most of my time thinking about is on the front end, before someone needs your help to defend against the lawsuit, how do you set these things up? They talk about the Internet of Things, and to me, that just translates to the Internet of Lawsuits because it's like every different thing that has a connection point with something else, that's another node that can go wrong in this web that is getting bigger and bigger. (laughs) And so I always say, look for the touch points and handoff points when you're setting these things up. It's easy to build a great app. It's not easy. I couldn't do it. But it's easier to build a great app, but it's a lot harder for that app to talk to all the other apps. Obviously, that gets into interoperability. The baton gets dropped at the handoff. That's the point where lots of things have to go right. You've got wearables. You've got in-hospital sensors. You've got patient check-in apps. I'm working with companies now that are using cameras at the workplace to look at who's social distancing or not, who's wearing a mask or not, and then contact tracing from there. And you can imagine the privacy issues and security issues when you're transmitting and combining all that data. So you're right. It's a whole new world with a lot to think about. You know, it's funny, Danny and Christy, there's a pill that has a tiny sensor in it that can be used to track and monitor the patient's adherence to drug treatment regimens. I mean, Mm -hmm. can you imagine how far we've come where you can actually take a pill that has a tracker in it that will tell whether or not you're taking your drugs or your medicines? And I think, Christy, I know that you do a lot of data privacy, HIPAA, and the cybersecurity risk related to all of this. But what do you think about that? I think with any digital health app or wearable that's collecting information that's sensitive, whether that be through Danny's example by an employer in the workplace and having cameras and tracking who you're coming into contact with, or Ray, your example of something that you actually ingest and is going through your body and potentially picking up even 
greater sensitive information that the privacy issues are very important. I think from an employer perspective, you've got the employment issues that overlie the privacy issues as well. So it can get pretty complex. And the way that states look at their privacy laws can also differ. So one of the things that we've been looking at in terms of the return to work from this situation is what tools employers can adopt in order to screen and trace, and then what consents you have to get from the employees to use that information. And a lot of it is transparency and consent-based, but also looking at what the ADA has to say, what the EUC has to say, Mm -hmm. what the CDC has to say. And a lot of this is new for a lot of these industries and for these agencies as well. Ray, your example is a great one, too, because smart pills and wearables, all the old categories are starting to break down. We used to have the two classic regulatory pathways, the drugs and the devices, and even that is breaking down now. And just this idea of combination pills that now generate data and throw data off. And so you've got not just FDA, but FTC and FCC. Everything is converging. And to FDA's credit, they've been really ahead of the game on this and saying, we need newer, more flexible models to look at these products and deal with them. But I think increasingly, too, the fuzzy border between human and machine, when you look at robotic surgery, the surgeon is guiding the robotic surgeon, but the tactile feedback that the surgeon's getting is being modified by the robot. Because The way robots sense things doesn't have the same natural feel as the way people do. So a lot of these have algorithms now that say, we're going to convert this to a more natural feel. And so Mm -hmm. now you've got the person who is supposed to override the robot when things aren't (laughs) going according to plan, getting their sensory input filtered through the robot that they're supposed to be overriding. A lot of times I'm sitting down with the designers of these things. Let's flowchart out. Where exactly is the information coming from? Is it a pure information source? Is it tied up with the same thing they're supposed to be monitoring? These are things that are obvious in hindsight, but not always clear when you're first designing or using the product. Yeah, I mean, I will say that over the 25 years that I've been doing drugs, (laughs) literally representing... Had to be a better way to say that. Yeah, I know. (laughs) representing pharmaceutical and medical device companies, the changes have been just incredible. And I look at it and I'm thinking, okay, this is a apps software. And is that considered separate and apart from the medical device or the medical product? Or is it actually a product? Or do we consider it a service? And Mm -hmm. the difference between those two things is similar, I think, Danny, to what you were saying in terms of where is that knowledge coming from, right? And what's being fed back to the doctor and who's responsible ultimately if a mistake is made, right? And Mm -hmm. to me, when you think about these app developers and the software that they send to you, are they liable for a failure of a medical device? It's interesting whether they'll be considered a service or a product. I don't or know both. if you've seen that. <laughs> yeah, or both. It's a yeah. great question, Ray. We've wrestled with that. The learned intermediary is one of the oldest protections in the book for manufacturers. And the question I always ask is, what happens when the doctor's no longer the more learned intermediary? <laughs> because <laughs> these days, a lot of times, <laughs> it's the true. other way around. <laughs> you've got the computer sitting over the EHR saying, well, I know you think that's what you want to do, but have you thought about this, this, and this? And it really does flip the liability model that we've had for a century, that the human is the gatekeeper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, let's face it, I think advancement is far better than the liabilities that we worry about. But it's important to understand what your potential liabilities will be. Continue advancing, but understanding that there's Even the risk for it, and I think people forget about this, but in all of these advancements in telehealth and AI and the smart apps and the devices, cybersecurity, to me, the breach, the possibility is a little scary. I don't know if you've thought about that, Christy, at all, but it's scary to me. Certainly. I think that there's really kind of two sides, too, because we're entering an age where people are more comfortable 
sharing information about themselves and just accepting the fact that their personal information is being collected and being used while at the same time being more attuned to the potential risk that that information will be used in an adverse way. A lot of the regulations that were eased with respect to telemedicine during the pandemic included enforcement discretion by the Office for Civil Rights, the agency that enforces HIPAA, saying, go ahead, clinicians and patients, and communicate via any non-public facing telecommunications technology in order to provide good faith telemedical services during this time period. And we've talked a lot with clients about which of these regulatory easements would be likely to continue after COVID-19 and which ones will go back to status quo or perhaps take that step farther. And I think that not only will privacy and security in terms of HIPAA enforcement go back to the status quo, but it's likely to take that step farther because of everything that has been going on during the pandemic. Cybersecurity, hacking, and incidents have also increased. In in many ways, HIPAA is an outdated regulation and that we may be looking at stronger privacy and security protections, possibly at the federal level, but more likely by individual states, much like California has done with the California Consumer Protection Act. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking back in 2017, the recall by the FDA of the pacemakers after identifying a potential, and I say potential, vulnerability in the software that would just allow hackers to alter the program settings. I mean, to me, the folks who are the bad actors in cybersecurity have gotten better. And quite honestly, we need to think about it in terms of someone's life, because if you can alter a pacemaker to the point that there's a rapid battery depletion or inappropriate pacing, then we're talking about someone's life. So, Danny, I know you were going to say something, and I'm sorry that I stepped in. No, no, that's actually, besides bumming me out, that's a perfect point to what I was going to say. (laughs) Well, no, because I was going to start with I'm an optimist, and now you just talked about hacking pacemakers, so I'm sad. You can still be an optimist, my friend. Still be an optimist. Other side of the coin. Look, granted, when you are able to hack life-saving devices, there are terrible people out there who would take advantage of that. Although I do think that that has so far seemed to be the exception rather than the rule. There is a real focus on device security and closing those gaps. But I tend to be an optimist. See, that was my segue. Because (laughs) so much of the error that we're correcting with these new technologies becomes background at that point, And you forget about that. It's what you were saying earlier, Ray. I was talking to the person who helped write the autonomous vehicle regs. He's now a partner of ours. And we're saying everybody talks about what if you can hack the car and drive it off the road. And certainly we have to protect against that. But that's against the backdrop that I think 98% of traffic accidents are human error. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, if you can solve 98% by putting the control into autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicles that never look down to change the radio or grab some more fries or all the things I do when I'm driving, <laughs> we can deal with that 2%. <laughs> I agree with that. Quite honestly, as I think through this, again, I think the advancements are amazing. And you look at, for example the ability for healthcare information to go from a patient who's sitting in their home to the doctor just because they waved their phone over a sensor. I mean, how incredibly great is that? Again, I look at the African-American community, I look at COVID-19, and I think to myself, this information is going back to the doctor. And it's also telling the patient in a more real way that you may need an insulin shot or you may need to have a certain type of food. So at any rate, Danny, I want to make sure that the listeners know that I am 100% behind the advancements in digital healthcare, even though there is this risk of cybersecurity hacking. I'm really excited about what 
data can do and the potential that the data holds in terms of what we may be able to derive from it through artificial intelligent tools and advanced analytics. And Danny, I know this is where you spend a lot of your time as well. So in terms of the AI that's going on with respect to the pandemic and the information that's being shared, what are you seeing and how willing are our entities to share information? Yeah, lots of good stuff in there. I played the optimist before, so I'll just play the pessimist now just to confuse everybody. But <laughs> <laughs> your Jekyll, my Hyde, my Hyde, your Jekyll. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, like my four-year-olds, I'm just contrarian. There is so much good that should and will come from data analytics, and there's no question. But never have we been more at risk of garbage in, garbage out. We're making societal decisions about where to put resources for pandemic treatment or triage or let's say we have a limited number of therapies, whatever that might be, a vaccine or a therapeutic. Let's say there's a sudden shortage of drug X because someone in a prominent position has come out and said, I think drug X works. <laughs> Hypothetically, we are at risk of amplifying biases in the data. And Ray, to your point about the systemic biases, racial and socioeconomic in the system, when we use data that comes from that world, if we're not careful, we can amplify those biases going forward. And now they've been blessed in the name of science. And I'll give an example, and I'll anonymize it a little bit. One health system was looking at where do we put limited resources. And so they wanted to look at who was most likely to be readmitted. And then that would be a proxy for people who needed special attention on the front end. They were deemed the highest risk. And the problem was what they actually ended up measuring with the best of intentions was people from historically marginalized and disadvantaged groups had the least access to health care and could not get readmitted as easily. So they ended up paying special attention to white patients with higher socioeconomic status, not because they were more at risk. They might have actually been at less risk. They were just better able to get to the hospital. And so... It's that old saying from business school, you get what you measure. So I am an optimist of the power of data, but I'm very cautious about its ability to amplify mistakes. And so when we pressure test these things on the front end with clients, those are a lot of the things we're looking at. And regulation lags facts and science, but it's coming. And FTC is looking at algorithmic bias, and there's lots of different bills that are looking at algorithmic bias, and you got to make sure your data is representative and pluralistic and matches the people you're trying to treat. So I'm an optimist, but I'm a cautious optimist. Yes, it's actually interesting about what you said, regulation following, because at the end of the day, and I know that our time is short, but I would say this in closing, at least from my perspective, that the court follows science. Science does not follow the court. And ultimately, again, I think that while there are many more product liability risk aspects to digital health, digital health care, telehealth care, it is amazing and it's so much more helpful for the person and the patients. So I think it's here to stay and that's a good thing. I agree, Ray. It's agree. here to stay and it's going to do a lot of good and like everything, it's in the execution. And I think we're learning the ways it can go right and we're learning the ways it can go wrong. And good design on the front end can put you on the right track. So I completely agree. And I think taking the time of a pandemic to charge forward in this space will also push laws and regulations to adjust and make way for this new world in a post-pandemic environment as well. So I think we're looking at some pretty exciting things to come. Well, yeah, and I'll just add in there, I'm very optimistic about the next pandemic because we've seen... <laughs> optimistic <laughs> about the next pandemic, my friend. <laughs> I would like that printed on a t-shirt that I can wear so the whole world can point out how poorly phrased that was. <laughs> <laughs> What we have learned from this pandemic is if you can 
intervene early, you can radically shape the outcome. You guys have all seen those projections. If someone intervenes just three days earlier with social distancing or a week earlier, the numbers are very, very different. And yeah. I think a lot of these digital health tools that we're setting up now to be pathogen independent can help us catch the next one earlier and intervene in the right places earlier. And I think that will have a tremendous impact. I agree. Could not agree more. And I do want my t-shirt that says, I'm optimistic about the next pandemic. Yeah, I'll order one. <laughs> yeah, please. It's been fun talking to you guys. And I really appreciate having the opportunity, Christy, to sit down and yap with you and Danny over these issues. Always fun. Yeah, good to talk to you guys. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you, everyone, to listening. Thank you for listening to DLA Piper's Beyond the Curve podcast. This podcast does not and is not intended to constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship between the firm and listener. All information, content, and materials discussed are for general informational purposes only. No listener should act or refrain from acting with respect to any particular legal matter on the basis of this information without first seeking legal advice from counsel in the relevant jurisdiction. 